Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Javari Shalayim in Harnov, Jerusalem. We're continuing Peah chapter 1, Halacha 4, and this is going to get into a lot of uh, exciting things on how we derive uh, Torah law and understanding. And more than a lot of other uh, sugyas, uh, in anywhere in either Shas, this is really going to be one that goes into a lot of detail to show us the tradition of how we um, get understanding from the way the Torah is written. So we're going to continue where we left off yesterday. The Gemara is going to talk about another verse deriving the other species that are obligated in Peah. So the verse states, when you beat your olive trees, you shall not safar behind you. And this means that you shall not remove all of the olive trees uh, peir, uh, splendor from it. And from here we learn that olive trees are subject to paya. We see here um, a note, uh, this this like uh, hint that in the way the Torah is written that we have uh, two different kinds of trees that are mentioned. We have the olive trees. And we also have grapevines. And obviously the way a grapevine grows is a lot different than the way an olive tree grows. So a lot of how we're going to start to understand paya is going to be because um, the olive tree is mentioned and then also the the grapevine, which is which is considered a tree but grows in a different way, and that you have to have these two different mentions of trees in order to get a, a true understanding of what's going on with the whole halaha and the relationship with it as we understand it today. So we can see here that the Torah in Devarim 2420 states that when you beat your olive trees, do not sefa'ar behind you. It shall be for the convert, the orphan, and the widow. And here, too, the law of Apeya is derived from the central verse, the central phrase of the verse, means you shall not um, sefa'ar behind you, which is not, say, which is not cited um, in in um, in the um, in the in this version of the Gemara, in the Bavli parallel version of this, uh, in Hulin 131, um, the Gemara is going to explain that uh, that this is in relation with Teferit, splendor, and uh, this is a supporting uh, usage of the word uh, peer. Uh, which is in reference to the headdress of the um, uh, Kon Gadol. So we know that also the, the splendor of somebody, we see the, it says, you, you know, you shall not um, round off the corners of your head. Um, so, so we see this similarity here. So the Gemara is going to ask, what reference to the mitzvah of Peya do you hear from this verse about emptying the splendor of the of the olive trees. And the Gemara is going to answer, Rabbi Yonah says, another verse states, you shall not round off the corners of your head. And that's in Leviticus 19.27. And by the way, that uh, that's not too far off where we were looking yesterday at where uh, we're learning Peah. So these are uh, verses that are very close to one another in the in the Torah itself. So um, the peyot sideburns are the splendor and the beauty of the head, and the Torah forbids rounding them off with regards to the olive tree too. And when the Torah forbids removing the splendor, it refers to the pay of the tree that must be left for the poor. So. In the Bavli version, the Mara Fulda makes a note that uh, there is no mention of Peas uh, Harosh, and the meaning of you shall not remove the splendor is somewhat unclear, but the Yershami is clarifying that this by making an analogy between the splendor of the olive tree and the splendor of one's head, uh, that is called Peo. And since the prohibition not to remove the splendor of the olive tree uh, is is there, it's also that uh, you also have the prohibition not to remove the splendor of the olive tree, 
and that means not to remove its peah. The Vilna Gon here makes a note that the Gemara is employing a device to show how uh, lo teferet, uh, lo, lo uh, tefar signifies the prohibition of removing the peah from the olive trees. And the beginning of the letters of this, um, basically the, the taf, the pay, and the rosh, or the, or the resh, for the uh, uh, for this verse, spell out says the Vilna Gon uh, tefar, and thus when the Torah is saying lo tefer, lo tefer in regards to the olives, it was used as if the word peya from peas uh, were written here explicitly, teaching that olive trees too are subject to peya, and that's. That's um, a deep insight from the Vilna Gon. The Vilna Gon is basically pointing out that when you're looking at the first letter of this verse over here, um, and you're taking out that first letter, the the taf, the pe, and the resh, that you're you're getting that. And so from over here and over there, um, that you can understand that um, that you're supposed to leave pe. It's a, a very novel uh, insight from the Vilna Gon. So the, um, the verse is going to continue. It's going to elaborate on the definition of peya with regards to vines and olive trees. Again, these two types of trees that are, are mentioned for, uh, for special rules for trees uh, in the Torah regarding this. The Gemara is going to delineate the criterion that must be met in order to include other species in the pay obligation. Just as olive trees and vineyards are distinguished in that their res uh, respective harvests are done all at once, says the sugya. In other words, that uh, each have their own harvest that is being done in one interval. Their harvests are not carried out in sporadic or scattered out over long stretches of time. It's all done at once. And says the sugya, their produce is brought in to last, um, and that, uh, and they are obligated in paya, so too all other species that meet these criteria, that is that their harvests are done all at once, and they are brought in to last, are obligated in paya. So we were talking about this yesterday, whether, whether we're going to read the Mishnah in terms of this being a list of trees that are are having paya, the, qual the quality of paya, or is this a list that's like an example for us to learn that here's a, a list of trees that have these criteria, and that if we discover new trees, that these will also have the, the quality of paya as well. So in other words, how do we understand this? So remember yesterday, the Mishnah is laying out these five criteria for what has to be met in order for the payah obligation to apply. And the Gemara here is only mentioning two of them. So it's interesting here because it's going to get into a rule for Maestros. So the reason for these two criteria, in other words, brought into last and harvested all at once, that they're being unique to payah because they are unique to payah. But those rules don't apply to Miser. Uh, that is where only the first three criteria in the Mishnah, things that are food, protected, and grow from the ground, must be met in order to, for the produce to be obligated in Miser. So these two additional uh, criteria, brought into last and harvested all at once, are also necessary in order for the produce to be obligated in pay, and therefore the Gemara is singing, singling out these two criteria as determining the characteristics for species that are subject to pay. Now, keep in mind that you have to have these other three characteristics in there as well, because you could say again with turnips or, or leeks that um, while they grow from the ground, they're harvested all at once, but again, um, they they um, they have to uh, you know be put together with these other criteria to say well they're brought into you know they have to be brought into last and harvested at once 
So in other words, that um, that you or or what you could do is you could say, well, you know, I'm I'm bringing in these these plants for dyes, and I'm bringing in I'm gathering them all at once, right? I'm gathering in all my woad crop, and and uh, these you know, but the, but it's not food, so it wouldn't qualify for miser. And if you add in all five characteristics, it doesn't qualify for pay either because it has to be food. But these two distinguishing characteristics are different from what qualifies something for obligation for miser. Um, that, you know, it has to be brought into last. It has to um, be harvested once, though, is unique to paya and not necessarily unique to miser. So the Gemara here is pointing that out, and um, the, this is going to be used for the Gemara to include other kinds of trees in the, in the Paya obligation. So the Gemara now wants to explore a question about if we can use this sort of um, uh, system for interpreting uh, how the Torah is written and apply it where maybe... Maybe the only the fruits that are are connected to Bikurim should be obligated in Paya. So here's what the Gemara is going to ask. It says, if so, then let us say further that just as vineyards and olive trees are distinguished in that they are obligated in Bikurim, and they're also subject in Paya, so too the derivation of all other species should be limited to those that are uh, similarly obligated in Bikurim. In other words, you have wheat and barley and pomegranates and dates, and only they should be obligated in Paya. And that's a question. In other words, maybe maybe the figs should also be included because they're, they're included in Bikurim. Maybe the figs and the fig trees should be included in Paya too. In other words, if, if we're going to try to interpret it um, this way, and the part of why this is connected is because um, in the verse for Bikarim, these are these are brought into last, and the Zait and the Karim are are additionally distinguished by the fact that they are subject to Bikarim, and the distinction then should play a role in determining whether. The other species are subject to pay, and this would limit the derivation of other trees to pomegranates and dates alone, and the derivation of grain to wheat and barley alone, excluding all other trees, grains, and legumes from the pay obligation. The Panay Moshe here learns that the Gemara here abandons the notion that being brought into last and being harvested all at once are determining criteria for pay obligation. Rather, the Gemara embraces this entirely new theory that anything that is subject to Bikurim is subject to Paya, and that would limit the Paya obligation to Shvius Haminim alone. But we, you know, again, this is a question. This is a way to say, well, wait a second. If we're going to just take a look at olive trees and vineyards and just say, hey, wait a second, um, forget about these three other rules that are listed in the Mishnah that could be used for determining Miser, and we're going to just use these as criterion to determine if they're obligated in pay. In other words, that they're harvested all at once and they're produced to last. Well, you have those same criterion for Bikarim too. So then maybe maybe it should be for Shvia Saminim and maybe other grains like spelt shouldn't be included in this. So the Gemara is going to answer. And how are they going to do it? They're going to bring actually how the Lakona Kodesh and the Torah works so that we can understand the law. So in Leviticus 19.9 and 23.22, um, the verse that's going to be used is katsir, the harvest. So the Torah states, your harvest to include in the paya obligation. So the sugya continues, says, even the harvest of rice and even the harvest of millet, despite the fact that they are not included in the Bikarim obligation, we can extrapolate from this that other species too, even those that are not subject to Bikarim, may also be derived from vines and olive trees, provided they do provided that they meet these other criteria above. 
So this this verse um, uh, ketsirecha is 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 being used here with the karam and the zait to to create this like compound binyan of construction, and that's being used to des to derive these other species that are subject to the peya. And the the Vilna Gon mentions that unlike the Gemara above, which derives legumes from the word our uh, our sechim, your land. Um, here, the Gemaras are going to include rice and millet, and all other similar species as legumes um, in the word your harvest. So, one thing to note here that um, there's a little bit of disagreement between the Bavli and your Shami. So, in Rosh Hashanah 13b in the Bavli, it's going to say that rice and millet are harvested uh, sporadically. So in this case, it's going to be hard to understand peya because that's one of the criteria. It has to be harvested all at once. But um, my, own, my own reading of this um, is the following, that many times uh, in the shas, in the, in the Yerushalmi shas, it's talking about different varieties and that Eretz Yisrael has different varieties of rice specifically. It has a different variety of rice that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And also, we could say that perhaps... Uh, millet is in that way as well, so that perhaps that superior version of rice um, was harvested all at one time, whereas the inferior versions that you could find in other places like Babel might have been sporadically. But um, we're also going to find that later on in, in uh, the rest of this halacha, of this of this chapter of, of halacha four, that. Uh, we're going to find other species of, of fruits and vegetables. So it could be that um, that the the rice of this native Eretz Yisrael rice that was uh, straight and, and perfectly white, that uh, and perhaps there was a variety of millet that was here that was not elsewhere, uh, um, is what they're talking about here. But outside of Eretz Yisrael, is a variety that they're talking about in the Bavli. Uh, many times you'll see a distinction between uh, the Yershami and the Bavli, and one way to resolve it is that in, in the Yershami case, it'll be talking about what's in Eretz Yisrael, and in the Bavli, it'll be talking about what's Hutz Aretz. So that could be a way to understand it. You can also check the Chazanish on Shvia 719 for another way to explain it. So. We can see here with the word um, ketsiricha, your harvest, that that this is being applied to um, to the pay obligation, and even for rice and and millet. And the Gemara is going to ask: the Torah should state the pay obligation only regarding olive trees, and it should not have stated the pay obligation regarding vineyards. So, why did the Torah have to say both the vines and all other trees? should be derived from the olive trees, right? So the, the, the Hachamim have a tradition that there's a special way to interpret. It's not accidental that the Torah is including the olive tree and including um, the vine. And they're basically saying that it has to be this way because you wouldn't be able to derive all the laws properly without it. And that's a very deep point. And that's what, what is so amazing about the Yershami is that they're going to come in and they're going to walk you through how we're getting this um, understanding and how how this tradition um, has been handed down since Moshe Rabbeinu. In other words, how we've always had this, um, this special reading since the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, so the Torah, so the Sugya says, the Gemara is going to explain why both verses are needed. It's going to say, if the Torah would have stated only that olive trees are subject to paya, and it would not have stated that vineyards are also obligated, I would not have been able to derive vines from olive trees. In other words, we were talking about that earlier, that we know that vines look a lot different than an olive tree, and that they grow differently, and they creep along and stick to things, and grow very laterally 
and we know that that you know trees grow up and down and that yeah you can you can harvest uh vines so that so that they're sticking up on fences but that's not really their nature they 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 would normally left be left alone they would sort of you know creep along the ground very low until they reach something and they might grow up that as a as a vine that's certainly a different way to grow than a date tree or you know pomegranate tree so this idea that it has to be stated here and there regarding this kind of tree and that kind of tree that without without that specific mention in the torah you're not really going to be able to derive the the laws for vines from the olive tree statement so the gemara continues says rather i i would have said olive trees which are exempt from the parent obligation are therefore obligated in paya but vineyards which are obligated to parrot should not be subject to paya and you can conclude from the verse you can conclude here that it is indeed necessary for the torah to say that vineyards are included in the paya obligation so in other words without without this right so you have in leviticus 1910 uh this statement that the fallen fruit of your vineyard you shall not gather and that we're instructed to leave for the poor um grapes individual grapes that that uh, fall down during the harvest the uh the leket so we wouldn't be able to derive um from without without the without the verse talking about the the carom and the and the vineyard we wouldn't be able to derive the these laws about about fallen grapes just from just from the uh the mention of the olive tree and this is going to this is going to give us a deep teaching because it's effectively going to show that hey wait a second if you're harvesting olives and some very choice olives and branches fall down that who who does that belong to does that still belong to the owner of the tree or can the poor person immediately come and pick it up or or would it be even hafker so so the answer in this case um by having it separate is to say effectively hey wait a second in this case of the individual grapes falling down that the poor person can collect and use to make wine or raisins um that's going to be belong to the poor person but in the case of harvesting from the from the olive tree that's going to belong to the owner still and in other words is teaching this uh halaha and the only way to get that that these two things are separated is because you're mentioning over here olives and you're mentioning over here the the grapevines and that without the mention of grapevines you can't figure out these other rules from from the tree and the way it's written if you just leave one of them it's impossible that's what the gamar is trying to show us that you have to have both and then later what's going to happen is they're going to they're going to use these these comparisons to build these uh binyan avs and and derivations of law to show us other laws so the sugya continues it says you conclude from here that it is indeed necessary for the torah to say that vineyards are included in the pay obligation and conversely you should also explain that if the torah would have said only that vineyards are subject to pay then it would have not said that olives are also obligated and i would not be able to derive olive trees from vines rather the sugya says i would have said only vines and vineyards which are obligated in parrot which uh, were also meant to be obligated in paya in other words that things that have a uh, parrot also have this characteristic of a paya so that if you didn't write the olive tree in there you wouldn't be able to distinguish one from another we know that the olive tree is obligated to paya we know the vine is obligated to paya but only one of them is obligated to parrot the 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 vine the vine the vineyard is obligated to parrot but the olives and olive trees are not so that means that if if the person is picking it up behind them and in the case of the the olive tree those branches that fall down with the olives those still belong to the owner 
But in the case of those those choice grapes falling to the ground, those belong to the uh, those belong to the poor person, and the 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 person who's harvesting it can't go back down and pick it up. It's not his anymore. It's it's belonging to the poor person. So that's by the way one of the things that's really amazing about uh, Zoriam, that in Zoriam you have you have two two parts of oral law. You have uh, Nezikim, which is things with ownership, and you have Zoriam, which are things with growing. And you have to look at it like this, with the things that are growing, that you have to do certain things to process it before you can use it. It's not actually yours yet, right? So if you have a harvest that's already had everything smooth and separated out, you can use it. But implicit within the process of harvesting and implicit in the pro process of uh, getting it to to the market field and to processing that uh, you have to you have to do it in a way because not all of it belongs to you yet part of it still can belong to the poor person or to the Cohen uh, and even even might be you know part of it might be with a Meister Shani might have you know a part of it where you can use it but it's actually divine property if you read it by Rabbi Mayer for Meister Shani then then it then there's always this part of it that that is always belonging to someone else, and that you have to separate it out before you can use it. And that's one of the differences, and that's what we have to keep in mind here. So the sugi here continues says, but the olive tree, uh, which are exempt from peret, should also be exempt from peya. And you can conclude here, from here, that it is indeed necessary for the Torah to say that olive trees are included in the peya obligation, and likewise. It is necessary to say that the vineyards are included in the pay obligation as well, and because if you if you didn't list both, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to derive one from the other, and also with the associated rules, with with parrot you wouldn't be able to derive one from the other. So the Gemara is going to summarize what was derived from the olive trees and vineyards, and it's going to it's going to pose a question. It's going to say, the olive tree was singled out as a tree that is subject to paya, and it was taught about all other trees uh, that it was subject to paya. In other words, um, you have this, this idea that, that you know, zayit, uh, which is exempted from parrot, but also subject to, to paya, and so too, uh, you know, the, the trees, all the trees should be exempt from parrot and subject to paya, that that, in other words, would just leave vines in its own category, where that just the vines have paya, it's a tree, and it's uh, it also has parrot. So the uh, the Gemara here is going to use a binyan av says uh, uh, says the Sefer uh, Chinook in two sixteen. It's going to say that um, that. Basically, that the Gemara here is using a binyan av, and it clearly derives that one is obligated to leave peya, but not uh, not only uh, by the zait and the karam, but by any tree that possesses the necessary criterion. So, this is this is going to provide a complexity. This is trying to figure out this obligation, whether it's deraita or it's going to be derabanan. So. Rashi and Shabbos 68a, um, the uh, the Tosfot in Nita 50a, the Rambam in uh, in Hilchos, uh, Matanos Aniam 12, um, Gilion Ashas, Sefer Chinook 216. These are all saying that that this obligation about the tree is biblical in nature. Um, the Rosh Cirillo in Maestros 11. Is also going to conclude that this is the prevailing halacha. There's the Maloka, Rabbeinu Tam, uh, the Rosh, the Rosh, uh, maintain that only grain, wine from vineyards, and olive oil are biblically subject to paya, and all other species mentioned in the Mishnah and derived from the Gemara here are only obligated uh, to rab uh, by by the by the rabbis, the Rabbanan. The uh, the Chazanish says in Derech Hamuna two seven um, that this is the final halacha that that these extra trees are are 
actually going to be uh, Durabanan. But um, your Shami doesn't seem to hold that. Your Shami here is going to seem to think that these other trees are are actually being derived deraita. So there's a there's a dispute here. Um, so it says that in the sugya that here and this is why the Yershami thinks that the other trees are subject to peya, and that this is going to be deraita. Says the olive tree was singled out as a tree that is subject to peya, and uh, it taught about all other trees that they are also subject to peya. So in other words, the Yershami is interpreting this as as a as a binyan av to say that just as the olive tree here is subject to peya. Um, and that these are the criteria for a tree to have uh, peya, that all other trees that are like this have peya, and that's doraita. That's what the Yershalmi is saying. The, the vineyard in this sugya, uh, it's not the opinion of all the Rishonim, however, but uh, the Rambam says it is, the Rashi says it is. Um, so let's continue. Um, the vineyard was singled out, and taught about itself that it is included in the payah obligation. Now, let us say that just as the olive tree was singled out with regard to payah and taught that the payah obligation applies to all trees, so too the vineyard was singled out with regards to parrot and should have taught that the parrot obligation applies to all trees. Why is it that the parrot only applies to vines? In other words, we see here that that uh, parrot isn't isn't being mentioned with the with the olive trees. It's only being regards to the the, the vineyard and that's singled out, and that's also you know being mentioned for paya. Um, and the olive tree is also singled out for paya, but that's not singled out for for parrot. So the Gemara is going to answer. Rabbi Avin says vineyards and olive trees are able to teach the peya obligation in other contexts only because peya is a law common to both of the, them, both of these kinds of trees. Thus, the peya obligation may be extended from them to other species using a binyan av. But the karam alone, says Rabbi Avin, cannot teach the parrot obligation in other contexts because parrot is a law that is not common to both of them. Since there is no parrot obligation with regards to olive trees, a binyan av cannot be used to extend parrot to other trees. So that's why you have to have the specific mention of the vine in the Torah. Um, the preceding Gemara is going gonna, is gonna to assert that it's necessary for the Torah to specify the pay obligation that, as applies to the vineyard. And that it's and that's also connected to paya, and that without it, you might have thought that it would be exempt from paya, but it is subject to parrot. So the Gemara is gonna is gonna now question this assertion. It's gonna say, according to Rabbi Ishmael, it is understandable that that the vineyard requires its own individual specification regarding the paya obligation. This is because Rabbi Ishmael taught the following hermeneutical rule, in other words, ways to interpret the Torah, and we say them every morning. Uh, this, this, by the way, is also mentioned in the Torah's Konim and in the Sifra, in the start of the Sifra. And these are the, the, the systems that are used to read the Torah and figure out um, the, 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 the halacha. And these guys were uh, really, a, you know, had a special tradition on how to read the Makona Kodesh and the diktuk and the arrangement of the Torah and to derive law out of that. We don't have that today, but these guys had that. And so this is this is what Rabbi Yishmael taught. It says, if following, uh, I'm sorry, if something is included in a general category, but is then singled out to be treated in a new case, it is now uprooted from the general category. And you may not return to... Uh, its general category unless the Torah does so explicitly. So rather, it exists independently in its own category, and conforming to this rule, it is necessary for the Torah to state the payah obligation with regards to the vineyard. In other words, 
since the vineyard was indeed singled out with regards to parrot, it would not retain the characteristics of its of original category with the pay obligation. And that's effectively why he's saying that the Torah writes it that it has parrot and paya. Because if, if you made it a new category as a type of tree, you would say, well, it doesn't have the category of parrot, of, of paya, it just has the category of parrot. And he's saying that when you're uprooting it, it has to now include both of them to keep it in there. So that's why the Torah explicitly restores it to that rule by stating it explicitly that it has a specification of paya and that it's necessary for, for including. Because again, it has two things. It has parrot and paya. So when it when it goes and it lists the parrot, it has to include paya in that in that uh, mention in order to keep it in there. So the Sugya says, but according to the opinion of the sages regarding the aforementioned um, interpretational rule, the specification of paya with regards to the vineyard seems to be unnecessary. They argue with Rabbi Yishmael and say something that was included in a general category, but was then singled out to be uh, to be treated as a new case remains in its original category, and in and at the same time, it also exists uh, in its new category. Accordingly, say the sages, the vineyard, although it was singled out with regards to parrot, still retains its pay obligation nonetheless. And the question arises, says the sugya, for what purpose was it necessary for the Torah to specify the pay obligation with regards to the vineyard? So the Gemara is going to explain the necessity to specify paya with regards to the vines, even according to the sages. So we know how um, Rabbi Ishmael is handling that. But what about the sages? The sages are saying that that when you're adding this new mention, that paya still is connected to it. So Rabbi Avin says, if only the vineyard were singled out from all other trees to specify that despite its distinction, it too is obligated in paya, then your question would be valid, since the general rule to assume that uh, to have all trees vines among them, and then despite its distinction, the vineyard retains the paya obligation, uh, it, it is superfluous to specify it again. But the sugya says, but but now that we, but now that both the vineyard and the olive tree were singled out, it serves as a primary uh, source for deriving the pay obligation by all other trees, and it emerges that the general category does not automatically include trees. Rather, the verse written with regards to olive trees is a source for including other trees in the pay obligation. So, if so. Uh, it is indeed necessary to specify the pay obligation with regards to the vineyard, as was already explained in the following manner. So, Sugya so says that if the Torah would have said that only only the olive tree is obligated in paya, and it would not have said that the vineyard is also obligated, I would not have included the other in vines, nor would I be able to derive the vines from the olive trees. Rather, says the Sugya, I would have said only an olive tree or similar species is exempt from the parrot obligation. And that was meant to be uh, obligated in paya. But, says the Sugya, the vineyard, which is different from the olive tree in that it is obligated from paya, from parrot, should be exempt from the paya obligation. Therefore, it is necessary, even according to the sages, for the Torah to specify the paya obligation with regards to the vines. In other words, the, the note here by the Mara Fulda is that the underlying difference between the Gemara's meaning here and above, um, even though the wording is exactly the same, is that earlier the Gemara assumed that the general category of the harvest included trees, and thus the vineyard should not need its own verse to be obligated in paya, despite the distinction, uh, since it is retained since it retained this property from the general category, now the necessity to specify the pay obligation in regards to the olive trees demonstrates that the harvest does not include trees at all. Consequently, the vineyard was never part of the general category. 
it is only from the olive trees that other trees may be derived, since the general rule never included them. Accordingly, I may derive other species from olive trees only if they are similar to olive trees. The distinction of parrot by the vineyard dissociates it from olive trees, so it may not be derived, therefore. So, conversely, if the Torah would have, would have written the obligation only with respect to the vineyard, I'd be able to derive other species only if they were similar to the vines and obligated in parrot. So from here, uh, I can conclude, says Amara Fulda, that it is necessary to teach Paya in respect to both the olive tree and the vineyard, uh, as the Gemara mentioned earlier. In the, in the final analysis, says Amara Fulda, that we derive from the olive tree, uh, from the Shvias Haminim, that they're, they're subject uh, to Paya, not the fig tree, by the way. Uh, the mention of the vineyard teaches that it is uh, itself subject to Paya, with, with your harvest teaches that any other species that meets these five criteria in the Mishnah is also subject to Paya, says the Mara Fulda. So here we have this exciting way to try to interpret what's going on. And now we're going to get into another category. It says, well, just as you teach the rule regarding matanos aniyam that come from harvest, in other words, the, you pay the worker to come, and he sees these nice grapes, he's allowed to eat, snack on some of them. He can't make it a meal. He can't, you know, you know uh, go eat so much that he's like, uh, you know, whatever, and taking a bunch of them home. But he can eat it. And he's allowed to eat it, and it's cruel not to let him eat it. Um, but note that not all not all fruit can can be eaten like that. In other words, olives you can't just eat olives off the tree; you have to dry them or make them into oil. So this is really going to be something having to do with more grapes or 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 figs or uh, maybe pomegranates. Just as you teach the rule regarding uh, these gifts that come from harvest, stating that anything that is harvested all at once is subject to paya, teach also with regards to the food benefits of a hired worker that their allowances should be limited to species that meet the same criteria. This is a question. In other words, the, the verse in Devarim 23-25 says, When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat as many grapes as you desire to satisfy your hunger. Uh, and when you come uh, into the standing grain of your fellow, you may pluck ears with your hand. In other words, you can you can you can take a couple of you know grain to take them home, but you can't take a donkey and load everything up and take it home. So so you you can't be a pig about it. You you can take a little bit, but you can't you can't go crazy and bring camels and and empty out the field. You can you can take home you know some of what you can carry. By your hand effectively but not not much more so the uh, the sugi is basically asking since the Torah specified food benefits with regards to the harvest of vineyards and grains we should derive that the characteristics of these species um, that that serves as a criteria to determine which other species are also subject to food benefits why then does the Torah grant food benefits by all produce that grows from the ground, even figs, without distinction as to whether they meet these criteria or not. So the Gemara is going to differentiate. So Rabbi Yona answers and says, the determination of food benefits from hired workers is different than the rule that applies to paya. In other words, they're trying to figure out that, hey, can we learn stuff from, you know, these gifts? Um, and can we connect that with Paya somehow? And Rabbi Yonah is saying it's different. He says, for with regards to hiring a worker, is written, quote, from the Torah in Devarim 23, 26, when you come into the standing grain of your fellow, you may pluck ears with your hand. The Torah specifically grants the worker the right to eat, uh, even from produce that is not brought into last, but is eaten immediately at the time of the plucking. From here, we can see the criteria for the, the food benefits of a hired worker are not the same as the criteria of payas. So in other words, 
in some of the cases you have food that you can eat right away like figs and figs are not subject to paya. In some of the cases like in the olive you can't you can't eat the olive right away but you can take some of them home. You can't you can't eat the the grain right away. You can take some of them home. But some of the foods you can eat right away like dates. Um, so the the mission is going to state and dates are obligated in paya. So the Gemara is going to discuss a species of date that's exempt from paya. It was taught in a Bryce, or Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Yudah, says, Rotev dates, a species of date that never mature completely, are exempt from the paya obligation because the earlier growths of these dates ripen before the later ones and do not wait for the later ones to catch up. That is that when the earlier dates are ripe enough to be harvested, the later dates still do not ripen adequately and they have their own they have their own harvest. Since Rotev dates do not meet the fourth criteria from the Mishnah, that they must all be harvested at once, they are exempt from Paya. But the sages dispute Rabbi Yossi's ruling, and the Gemara inquires as to the rationale for this dissenting opinion. Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Yudah, has spoken well. The reason he gave to exempt Rotev dates appears to be flawless. What then is the reason the sages who dispute the ruling and maintains that Rotev dates are indeed subject to paya? In other words, he's saying, hey, wait a second, you need to harvest these dates at two different times, so it doesn't meet the obligation of paya. Sages say, no, 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 actually it does. So what could be the argument that the sages are using to, to say, hey, wait, this is obligated in paya? So Rabbi Zerah comes to save the day and is going to answer. And he says, the reason Rotev dates are subject to paya is because after the harvest is complete, all the Rotev dates need to be are need to be left into piles on the ground or in baskets for a warming process that causes them to all ripen at the same time. In other words, um, they're harvesting all the Rotev dates at once, even ones that really are not ripe. And they're all heaped together for this ripening stage. And because of that, it's considered as if they were harvested all at once, and now they have to maintain this uh, category of paya. So, so left alone, if you look at the tree by itself, you'd say, well, this one ripens here and this one ripens there, so therefore not subject to paya. But the way they were doing it for this particular category of, of date species was they, they would take all of it down together, put it onto the ground to ripen, it all be ripening together. And and because all of the Rotev dates are ripening together, uh, therefore it is subject to pay. Now the Gemara is going to discuss the halachic status of something called the colchis plant. Uh, the colchis plant uh, is, a, is a strange vegetable that uh, is is included in the Shvius prohibition. Um, there's going to be differences between trees and vegetables regards to Shvius, uh, and the Colchis plant is uh, it's a storable plant. So, like uh, that is subject to paya, like like garlic and onions. Uh, but uh, but there are other people like the Vilna Gaon who ma maintain that the Colchis plant. Uh, is perishable, perishable and that it, it, it is exempt. Um, so it's hard to know what exactly the, the colchis plant is. Uh, the colchis plant is uh, subject to maestros only by rabbinic uh, decree. Um, so let's take a look at this sugya. So Rabbi Yitzchak ben uh, Kalua Kak Kakula uh, and Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi both said the colchis plant is considered a vegetable with regards to the law of Miser and with regards to the law of Shvius and with regards to the law of Paya. In other words, they're saying that it is storable. However, with regards to netarim, uh, in other words, if somebody wants to make a netter where they're going to forbid a certain fruit or a vegetable on himself, uh, the permissibility for him to eat the colchis requires clarification. 
So in other words, it's this strange plant where um, that uh, that it has characteristics of both a tree or a vegetable, and that if you're making a a, a vow to say, oh well, I'm not going to eat any vegetables, then then you might not be obligated under the, the coccus plant. And if you say, well, I'm not going to eat any trees, uh, you might be obligated under the coccus plant because the coccus plant has some characteristics of a tree. So they're saying that this particular plant uh, has this strange characteristic of both plants and tree, um, vegetables and trees, and therefore that you have to make a halakha clarification um, on, on whether whether you're going to say I'm, I'm not eating any vegetables and apply it to the coccus plant or I'm not eating any trees and apply it to the coccus plant and that uh, the halakhic status of the coccus requires clarification with regards to paya and other laws. In other words, it's hard to know whether it's a vegetable or, or a tree. Anyway, that concludes everything for now. Uh, actually, paya chapter 1 halakha 4 in many ways, is an underrated uh, chapter and, and halakha because it has a lot of these um, amazing tools that the sages show in action on how to interpret the Torah and how to interpret or law and how to have this tradition in Eretz Israel of reading the Torah and building binyan avs and hekeshes and um, these gezer shavas. And you don't see a lot of this in action in in the shas, in either shas, but here it is with with them actually going through and walking you through it. So we're going to see you again tomorrow for chapter one, halaha five, payah.